Hi, and welcome to Viewmaster Travels. I'm Dave, and I collect these vintage 3D Viewmaster reels. Each of these discs contains pictures from some place around the world. This is how people saw exotic places that they couldn't visit easily. Today we're going to look at one of the first Viewmaster reels released. This is reel number 10, Boulder City, from 1946. I've always found this reel a curiosity. Why was such an obscure location one of the first discs made? Truth is, when I got this reel, I didn't know where Boulder City was. Turns out it's here, near the Hoover Dam, which makes sense since the other early Viewmaster reels were of the Hoover Dam, and the dam used to be named Boulder Dam. So, Boulder City is clearly related to Hoover Dam, but why was it important enough to make a reel about? For this episode, we'll try and find out. We went to Boulder City with our Viewmaster reel, and we tried to find each of the pictures on it to see what's there now and learn some history along the way. I got this brochure that was printed just after the Viewmaster pictures were taken, and you can see that the city isn't very big. I'll mark each picture on this map as we find them. Here's the first picture we were looking for. U.S. Bureau of Reclamation Administration Building. When you get into town, this building literally dominates the landscape. It's at the top of a big hill overlooking everything, and all the roads lead away from it. I couldn't match the angle exactly because there was this keep out sign on the stairs and I wasn't sure making a YouTube video counted as official business. The Bureau of Reclamation was formed in 1902, and their goal was to reclaim the arid lands of the West. They felt it was their duty to convert the Western deserts to farms for new settlers, to subdue the desert. This culminated in the Boulder Canyon Project Act of 1928, an ambitious plan to dam the Colorado River to build the Hoover Dam. To do this, the government decided to build an entire city to house the needed workers, Boulder City, making it the very first federal city owned and operated entirely by the U.S. government. This is one of the harshest places on the planet, and I was starting to see why a remote, government-owned city way out in the desert might have interested our Viewmaster photographer. The government hired architect Sako Ryang de Boer to design their new city. It would be the finest construction camp ever constructed. This design phase took place before the Great Depression, during the Roaring Twenties, and the government wanted to have their city reflect the optimism of the time. De Boer based his ideas on concepts initially used in Radburn, New Jersey, an East Coast planned town being built at the time. He created separate districts, government, business, and residential, using large blocks of buildings surrounding large grassy parks, lots of greenery to show how tamed the desert was. The main streets would radiate away from a central set of government buildings, which sat on the largest hill, and the different blocks of housing were for the different types of homes, from large families to single residents. But global events would change his plans. We'll learn about that in a second. First, here's the next picture we were looking for. Terraced government lawn. We quickly realized that each picture we needed was in sight of the last, and this one just meant turning around and looking down the hill from the administration building. I assume these people are government workers heading home for the day. Before construction on Boulder City could begin, the U.S. stock market crashed and the Great Depression began, putting thousands of people out of work. When the location of the construction project was announced, thousands of families rushed to the desert in hopes of getting a job. Obviously, there was nowhere to live in this incredibly harsh and unforgiving desert, so people formed camps along the canyon leading to the site. This became known as Ragtown, and living conditions were extreme. 
The government had hoped to have their city built before construction began on the dam, and had only expected to house workers, not their entire families, but now the situation was desperate. De Boer's ambitious plan was cut back to its simplest elements, and construction began at a breakneck pace. Within a year, Boulder City housed 5,000 workers. The scale of the construction project was unheard of, and the government felt maintaining strict order in town by making casinos, bars, and brothels illegal was absolutely necessary to keep the work on track. To do this, the government decided they'd need to run things their own way by making a federal reservation where democracy didn't exist and Nevada state law didn't apply. It was almost literally a walled garden in the desert. Administration Building Park This view is just a few steps away from the last one, but you can see today and in the 40s how green this small area still is. Maybe this little desert park on the corner was to remind you that you did still live in a desert. Boulder City was the first federal model city in the U.S., but model company towns had been relatively common. These were towns built entirely by a private company. All the houses, shops, schools, churches, everything was owned by the company to house its workers. Many companies like mines, mills, large factories, and so on were outside of the cities. And this was before everyone had a car. So housing your workers right next to your factory made a lot of sense. It also meant you could control every aspect of your workers' lives, both at work and at home, whether you had their best interests in mind or not. When we were in Chicago hunting Viewmasters there, we visited one of the most famous U.S. company towns, Pullman, which is here, just south of the city. This town was built entirely by George Pullman and the Pullman Palace Car Company, around their factory that made luxurious rail cars. Pullman and his architect Solon Berman designed what they felt to be the model town for their workers, giving them everything they needed, and what they accomplished was a significant improvement over the Chicago housing of the time. However, 10 years later in 1893, a financial panic devastated the rail industry and Pullman's sales slumped. He decided to lower workers' wages to stay profitable. But he also controlled the rent prices and the grocery prices, and he didn't lower those. The workers went on strike, and the strike got ugly, crippling rail traffic across the country. The army was deployed to Chicago, and fighting broke out, leaving dozens dead. These events caused major changes in the U.S., including the creation of Labor Day as a federal holiday. The Pullman Company was forced to sell off its residential holdings, and company towns fell out of favor. The Pullman strike was a recent memory as Boulder City was being built. South Escalante Plaza. This one's just a few steps from the last one, looking back at the admin building. The landscaping's changed dramatically over the years, but otherwise it's the same. As opposed to Pullman, which was created by a private company, Boulder City was created, designed, and paid for entirely by the U.S. government. The land it's on was reserved using the same laws used to create Native American reservations, and many of the old documents I found called it the reservation. For the workers, it was a safe home for themselves and their families, eventually providing them with everything the government thought they would need, although they didn't initially build any schools, only completing the first elementary school in 1932. But state law didn't apply in Boulder City, and the residents had no say in their local government. Only approved businesses could operate in town, and gambling and alcohol were prohibited. This was all the government had decided in their best interest. Oh, and you couldn't live there if you were black. 
the degree of control the government had would soon become clear. Working conditions at the dam were tough, even deadly, and a nationwide labor union, the Industrial Workers of the World, decided to get involved to help improve conditions. They sent one of their members, Frank Anderson, to Boulder City to get a job on the dam, but his real mission was to recruit union members by selling the IWW's newspaper, The Industrial Worker, in Boulder City. Fearing another Pullman strike, the government cracked down on Anderson. They fired him, which also meant he lost his right to live in town, making him homeless. Then they sent Deputy Sheriff Eddie Johnson to arrest Anderson on charges of vagrancy. And then Johnson arrested two others as they tried to get funds to help defend Anderson. And the next day, five more people were arrested for selling industrial worker in town. Meanwhile, rumors of the workers' wages were being cut started to spread. The IWW saw their opportunity and organized a labor meeting. The workers voted to go on strike, and all work on the dam stopped. The government told the strikers they could protest, but not on government land. They sent trucks to the site and drove the protesters to Las Vegas. The strikers set up a picket line on the road outside Boulder City. But the government hired an entirely new set of workers willing to work at the lower wage and built a large gate across the road so the strikers couldn't return home. Work resumed on the dam as if nothing had happened. The IWW complained to Nevada Governor Fred Balzar, who told them that the state could do nothing since it was federal land. Boulder City Business Street This one's a good example of the design of the city, looking along Arizona Street through the small commercial area in town. This old pharmacy is now an antique store, which had some nice viewmasters, and the original air-conditioned movie theater is still there. Now it's the home of the local ballet. After the strike, Sims Eli was put in charge as city manager. He really locked down the walled garden. There are no loafers, gamblers, or underworld characters for the simple reason that no one is allowed in the city unless he works or has business there. Eli decided who could come through the gate into or out of town, who could have a house, and which businesses could exist. He controlled public health and welfare as well as local law enforcement, and some called him the local dictator. If you were caught gambling or with alcohol, you answered to Sims. If they thought you were union, you answered to Sims. If your library books were late, go see Sims. Your cow attracts too many flies, go see Sims. I think you were constantly under threat that you might lose both your job and your home if you misbehaved. But according to residents, Boulder City was one of the safest, most comfortable places to live. With intense government focus and funding, the city really did get everything the workers and their families needed. By 1932, Boulder City boasted 100 businesses, including restaurants, drugstores, barbershops, men's and women's clothing stores, apartment houses and auto courts, gasoline stations, a newspaper, entertainment establishments, and professional offices. In 1936, two years ahead of schedule, the dam was complete, and Lake Mead began to fill. Lake Mead from Boulder City This one's kind of funny. Looking at this, I assumed the picture was taken from here, Hemingway Valley Park. So we drove down there to see. You can see the lake from there, but it's not the same view. However, we did see a bunch of sheep wandering around through the park. I guess they come down from the mountains to eat the grass. But we still needed to find this picture spot. So we drove back up the hill and realized we could see the same view from the road. Looking up, we saw the admin building above us. So the Viewmaster photographer had just taken the shot from behind the admin building. 
And when he came to town to take these pictures, the dam was done. The lake was full and the war was over. And the intent was to demolish most of the city. But the residents wanted to stay and they purchased their company houses. Truth is, many of the residents and businesses didn't want the government to relinquish control at all. They were happy without the gambling and vice. But other residents saw the post-war economic boom spreading through the rest of the country and felt they were missing out. A 10-year heated political fight took place between the two groups, seemingly at an impasse. However, it turns out the government couldn't afford to run the town anymore, and they didn't want it. So each year, they kept cutting the city's budget. The government stay group realized that without government money, there'd be no town at all, and relinquished. Boulder City incorporated under its own control in January of 1960. The city's first mayor was Robert N. Broadbent, the owner of the pharmacy we saw in the Viewmaster picture. And that was the last picture we were looking for. We found Boulder City a really pleasant, quiet little oasis in the desert, inviting and easy to get around. The people were friendly and excited to tell us the history of their town, helping me solve the mystery of why it was one of the first Viewmaster reels made. Plus, now I know where it is. And that's it for this episode. Thanks for watching.